Welcome to the podcast that questions everything, from conspiracies to philosophy, from science to religion. We will be looking at the construct of the illusion, and as always, we will question everything. Hello and welcome to Everything's an Illusion, a podcast where we question everything. I'm your host Rob Wallace and I'm joined again with the bearded master of sci-fi, Mr Greg Andrew. How are you, Greg? I'm very well, sir. Hello, people of podcast land. Super. So we've got an action-packed, uh, a pondering your navel type uh, podcast, as it always is. Pondering your navel for you to Denny Ken. It's just table tennis back and forth. So we've got Hollywood car sitters. The backbone of the industry suing. We've got uh, the elite in the shadowy overtones. We've got the Oscars. We've got the meteor shower in Scotland. And a look at the Martian movie. Oofed. Oofed. Superb. So, without further ado, just jump straight into the Hollywood uh, car, sp- car park space sitters. Um, quite interesting, eh, Greg? Quite an yep. interesting uh, idea here that um, without... So basically, what these guys do, like, for instance, in New York, um, for a week before a major production, say, like American Hustle or The Amazing Spider-Man, before they rock up, these guys basically are phoned up by the big production companies and they drive down to the street where the, the film is going to happen and they start to, they, they just basically drive around until they get a parking space and then they just keep on feeding the meter and then they start staying in their car, you know, doing 150 hour weeks, staying in their car, feeding the meter and basically when the production crew arrives a week later, they've got all the parking spaces for again for the for the food wagons for the um, armory for the for the you know, all the different things that you need in a huge Hollywood production. So these guys um, basically live in their car, um, pee in their car. One of the guys and the, the, and it, what's happening at the minute is they don't get paid. They get the below minimum wage. They get fucked over left and right. They're seen. They're totally indispensable to the the film industry, but they're totally at the bottom of the shit pile. And uh, due to like long, long hours in the car, um, unheated, you know, this sort of stuff. Like one of the guys that they're all suing them. They've joined together quite rightly so for the workers, and they're suing these big uh, Hollywood um, production companies. That one of the guy knew knew how to wear adult diapers. Um, and there's a, there's a few of the, the others that like urinate in the car just like in a bucket you know that sort of thing because they can't get out they, they basically they're stuck in this um, car 24-7 until the crew arrives that's their job you know is to secure the parking spaces mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> and then being at the bottom of the pile um, it's really good to see that the the folk at the very bottom that make that Hollywood magic really happen. Again, these are key people that are sacrificing their bodies and their minds and getting paid peanuts. Uh, actually taking some action, joining together and saying, no, we are just as important as other departments. If it wasn't for us, you would the hub kind the film. Just like if you never had a VFX department, if you never had directors if you never had actors or makeup or um, locations or whatever yeah. else just as important and it's about time um, obviously being to uh, folk with interest in the film industry you know it's it's good to I think it's good to see people at the bottom um, getting up especially when these big businesses uh, essentially save money by employing migrants and, and, and minorities and that's how they get away with it that's yeah. what their, their game plan is it's basically fuck you if you don't want a job fuck off and that's the wrong attitude these guys are doing a, a long shift you know Yeah. And I mean it, it just it goes to show I think myself and yourself who have went to college and university and did media studies and worked on big productions I know you don't like to name drop, Rob, but I believe you might have worked on a big production yourself when it was in Glasgow. I 
uh, we uh, Brad Pitt number, yeah. Hey, Brad Pitt, World War Z, that's the very one, but... I fucking ran that show. You did, you did indeed, but... <laughs> I think I never, this I is, never. <laughs> this is a very well. That's that's not what I heard. That's why there's any problems because you're in charge. But that's a different point. But these guys, it's a very specific thing. I've been. It's to to New York. Cause New York's a very unique city that everybody wants to film in. But the cost of filming in New York is astronomical. I haven't shut down streets or uh, shut down bridges and stuff like that. And then you need a big parking space for Will Smith's big giant thing where gem in it and stuff gem and all that stuff so what these guys are doing is instead of uh, a big giant production company paying extra money to come in on a day and rent that street out and get people to move their cars and get people to have to rearrange their work schedules like if you lived in that street or you worked on that street you would usually park there and put a meter what they're doing is they're kind of trumping these normal workers in New York by a week sitting in their cars, taking up these spaces, and then the production comes in on the Monday morning, they move the cars, the production company moves their stuff back in. It just goes to show the levels of... Organisation, organization forward it planning. In, it goes into something like that. Uh, I know uh, they talked about the film Trainwreck, and I know uh, the Spider-Man films and stuff like that, they really need to use locations within New York. I think people like Martin Scorsese and Woody Allen... When you're talking to the directors and stuff like that, they have an idea of what goes on in the production, but they're not working at that level. Leonardo DiCaprio's no worrying about the wee guy who has to part there for a week, you know what I mean? Uh, Martin Scorsese is happy because he's getting that streak, but it's the production company and it's the producers and it's the line assistants and all the guys who are working down the line to make sure that this can happen for these guys. Uh, is that at this point, they're the getting, locations department. Yeah. And uh, they would be logistically can sorting all that stuff out, yeah, and way in advance. But one of the the main things that they're, they're taking them to court for is because even though they do that and they're already getting paid a shit wage, they still fudge. Um, yeah, because they're, they're, they're not because they're not actually the production starts on the Monday. Aye. But they they, no, they but they're they, there they, for a week before, you know what I mean? So, so what's happening is they don't get entitled to no, it's the, 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 the Teamsters sh- Union stuff that they have in America and all aye, that the, sort of aye, they they healthcare get, payments and stuff. But it says here the and I'll put up this um article uh, on the page obviously. It says um when big businesses want to save a couple of dollars, they usually turn to the minorities. And then it goes on to say it's um uh, the complaint details a system whereby Parking production assistants are given a flat rate for a full 12 hour shift or a 6 hour half shift. However, if they work too few hours to meet a minimum, they are paid nothing for the time the suit alleges. If they exceed the set hours, the suit charges timesheets are falsified to give the appearance of complying with wage laws. So there's a lot of, uh, it's called uh, James A. Vagini, a nice name, one of the lawyers representing the plaintiffs, described the practices as backing into the timesheets, which is basically yeah. fudging the hours in order to neatly fit them into the, the, the pay structure and the pay shift. So no matter how many hours they work, yeah, it looks good yeah. on the company yeah. books. It's not about how many hours they worked. Yeah. It's like you worked 100 hours, well, I can only make it look good at 60 hours, so that's what you're getting. Yeah. And who are you? Do you want to... I think, I think the way New York set up, I don't think there's any public bathrooms or toilets kicking about. I think that's just... And that's where it comes to like guys uh, like you know, using nappies and yeah. And it, one of the things that's quite interesting for me is obviously on that um, World War Z. I was at the the bottom of the rung. I was the guy who was um, moving the businesses, uh, and bins etc. for the bin men. I was carrying water. I was um, putting up fencing. I was um, crowd control. Uh, every kind of. Uh, bottom of the wrong job, you know, it starts to rain, you run over to the the camera folk and put up a wee tent for them so they don't get wet and then run to the next crew and put up a wee tent for them and it was that kind of, um, you're at the bottom, just just work, first yeah. train to Glasgow, last train back, work, um, and it's good to see that these guys can get in a wee bar. Yeah, so I mean... Hopefully they'll they'll get recognised for the actual work that they do, and then, you know, it'd be nice to think because I think what happens in New York is if you're coming in, you, 
the production company would maybe come in a week before and put production starting there like a sign up that says no parking. If you're a New Yorker and it's Wednesday and it says no parking, you're like, fuck that shit. I'm just going to park here anyway. So they do this kind of practice of parking these cars and kind of basically blocking MDLs for parking in these spaces so that the production comes in. So yeah, good on them. Get unionised, get get collectivised, get together, put your case forward. Hopefully winning this might <clears throat> open the doors to a better practice towards the bottom end because the amount of money they spend on stuff that they don't need is uh, fucking ridiculous sometimes in films. So well, in World War Z, they um uh, they they hired um a whole host of paintings and room furnishings to basically kit out a a, a, a council because uh, the the sort of if you like VIP kind of stuff was on the Glasgow City Council they hired out this kind of. Spent loads of money to get all this furnishing to fit out a room so that some of the stars could feel comfortable. Yeah. Know what I mean, so they paid me for that then. And what I was well, getting paid, paid you, uh, eh? and I'm like, oh, what's this all about? I'm crucial. I'm yeah. moving shit. <laughs> right, so from, from Hollywood to Hollywood, what you got next? Well, it was the Oscars this week. The pinnacle of show business, as some may, may see it, and I was. Quite a bit of controversy towards it. Some highs, some lows, some laughs, some tears, all that sort of stuff. But I don't know if you'd seen much of the controversy. Oh, I, I, no, no, I don't. No. I don't follow the Oscars at all. Uh... Oscars. Well, obviously, out of the best supporting actor, actress, actor, best actor, and best actress, there's twenty nominations. There was no person of color nominated this year. So there was a hashtag, uh, Oscar So White, uh, that went out and a few people, a few high profile celebrities boycotted. Will Smith and I think Spike Lee as well they boycotted it this year. So they had that going in the background and Chris Rock was the presenter this year. So there was a kind of theme throughout the Oscars this year that was pointing itself at the lack of diversity within its makeup. And this is the academy they're talking about, and the voting practices that go towards that, which again raises another question: Why aren't there uh, actors of colour or actors uh, from Asia or Indian actors or uh, you know Canadian actors? You know they never get a chance. But so this, there's a whole uh, discussion going on right now with. And I feel the Oscars was kind of like a focal point because it is the big industry event, but I think it raises a bigger question about the the Hollywood system. If there is, I don't think it's the Oscars' fault that there was no people of colour up for that. I think the fact that Hollywood doesn't make films that are deemed Oscar material for actors from those kind of diverse backgrounds, I think... The big ones this year, as you could say, were maybe Creed. But the only Oscar nom it got was for Sylvester Stallone. Uh, Straight Outta Compton, which I sadly haven't seen yet. I don't know if you've seen Straight Outta Compton. I've seen Straight Outta Compton, yeah. It was, it was all right. It was yeah. not bad. It wasn't, and, wasn't any better or worse than any of them. Yeah, and then this, the other one was uh, Will Smith and Concussion. I haven't seen Concussion. I've seen the reviews. They're saying he's really good in it, but the film itself doesn't really... It's more of a kind of TV movie of the week. So it might not be Oscar's fault that they can if although Idris Elba in Beasts of No Nation I thought was brilliant. So there was that. I think he could have maybe have had best supporting actor or best actor nom uh, in there. But so it has opened this whole question about why Hollywood itself will let migrants sit in a car for twelve hours a day or twenty four hours for a week, shitting and pissing themselves. But when we give uh, actors of colour and different diverse backgrounds the chance. So it is, I'm just bringing that up to kind of think that's the kind of state that big blockbuster Hollywood's in. Because I think when you look at the kind of indie scene that probably perks our interest a wee bit more, there's a lot of that going on. I think a film like Tangerine we've spoke about from a technical point of view because it was shot in the iPhone and stuff like that. But within that, there was great performances from actors of diverse backgrounds and actors of LGBT backgrounds as well so 
I felt a bit sorry for the Oscars. They were getting... They were like the focal point for what I think is a bigger Hollywood problem than just the Oscars being racist. I think Hollywood itself has problems when it comes to giving actors the role of race. It was like the Fantastic Four. What was the big uproar about Fantastic Four? Apart from it being slightly bad. Slightly bad it was. Yeah, well, uh... I'm, I'm just trying to be nice to it now because I think too many people... <laughs> If, it was, if you remember what the big uproar was about Fantastic Four. It was utter pish. Was that a big upset? No, I think there was that and the fact that it was a black actor playing Johnny Storm. I, yeah, I've, I've, not, I've not seen it. You know what I mean? <laughs> but, I mean, it, it's like, for me, good good on him. I mean, he's, he's a comic book character that he doesn't have to be. <laughs> Just because of comic books, I think there's a lot of that going on. I know we, we, I mean, we've cast things in the past that have been in the written page, just kind of generic, because, eh, uh, uh, generic kind of maybe white characters because we maybe know what, but we have changed these characters within scripts and stuff like that. I think postcards we had a lot of patience in the scene if you remember, we kind of made a couple of them, we made like different from diverse backgrounds just to kind of. Oh, give like, a melting um, point in there and give it a bit more of a diverse feel. But that's only because we're cool fucking hip guys, but... Well, definitely, I think uh, at the end of the day, a, a film or a piece of art or a piece of music or whatever it is, poetry, language, you know, it's irrelevant of colour. It's irrelevant of... Uh, and it should just be about... Um, you know, the quality that's yeah. being produced and stuff, but I think from a conspiratorial point of view, I've always been kind of curious about the Oscars as in, like, what is its function? Obviously, the, the whole kind of top end of the film industry is owned by white Jewish guys. Um, there's obviously a big Illuminati, or whatever the fuck the Illuminati is, um, kind of... Uh, woven into, for instance, the symbol of the Oscars is a, a man silhouetted standing inside a, a triangle. Almost looks like, kind of top of his eye is uh, the eye in the pyramid. Kind of, kind of look, and also the the classic uh, Oscars um, statue, if you like, that gets given out to um, to the to the, the the winners is made of gold. He's uh, got a sword going down the middle, and he's standing on a five-pointed star. Now, looking back in history, the exact same sort of, or almost the same kind of statue with the pole going down the middle, standing on the star, is from Egypt, Osiris. Um, and there's a few other Egyptian kind of, um, that are exactly the, the same. So there's definitely a lot of symbolism um that goes along with the the oscars and there's there's a lot obviously if you just search oscars illuminati oscars conspiracy oscars um again the ruling class etc etc you're going to find a shed load of information with regards to this you can do your own research folk out there on podcast land but like hollywood in itself hollywood we've discussed this before but hollywood was the um the branch of the tree or the tree that the wizards would prefer to use for their um a a wand from the hollywood tree it was the preferred uh, wood for casting spells or using f for making your wand to cast spells and that's what the hollywood industry does it casts spells uh, uh, it foreshadows what's about to happen and it tells you who to hate etc etc and i most definitely think like the other major industries of media it's completely controlled by the shadowy overlords so <laughs> and that is multi-millionaires giving other multi-millionaires lovely gold statues which is nice nice oh, to why? see and lovely dresses but i don't know if you had a wee chance to see the winners if you had any comments just as well I seen praising, uh, praising your battles <laughs> Le leo um i couldn't escape that on the facebook timeline did he win i good on him Leo Di Leonardo DiCaprio won one for The Revenant, which was a good movie. And when I watch a bit of Hollywood movies, I do think he is a very good actor. So yeah, well, I think the thing with that is everybody's like, 
Oh, it was his time. He deserved it. He'd been he'd done such great work in the past. It's obviously he was going to get but I actually think when you look at the rest of the category, who he was up against this year, if that was for the Academy of Motion Arts pictures, whatever they're called, they were given as Matt Damon, Michael Fassbender, Eddie Redmayne, and Brian Cranston. I think his performance was probably the best out of the five, in my humble opinion. So I think it was a case of him, it was his time to win it, but I thought he was performing yeah. what in the ring. I thought it was. I thought it was. I thought the ring was, was really good. good. Uh, climbing was, inside a, 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 a dead animal and all that. I think kind of actually the biggest, the biggest one of the night was Mad Max Fury Road. That won six. What? Get the fuck it was pish. Well, take it up with the academy, isn't it? I can do better. Ah, it was. Um, obviously, it, it was fast paced. It was. It done exactly one, what it said in the tin. But come one, on, that was one pish movie. One costume, makeup. Uh, production design, sound, editing. They were one story. Uh, do, do, do. They did not win a story, no. Uh, best original screenplay went to Spotlight, which is the Catholic priest's investigation in Boston. Maybe something we'll talk about in the future. That's a bit such See, a fucking lovely the, subject. The, the, the ones that I, 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 I like the most, and obviously... Uh, the podcast is sponsored by robwallacemedia.com and you can check out the Facebook, Rob Wallace Media. But I post a lot of things on the behind the scenes, the VFX, like how the movies are made or how music videos are made, like the kind of like Game of Thrones or um, kind of a, a sort of like how they do the green screen and stuff. Yeah. And it's one of the, the, the biggest things. Obviously, makeup and department and sound and all these people are important, but more and more the whole movie is made by VFX guys you know it's um it's... Well, do, you, do you know who won the best VFX nope will we play a wee game then on podcast land so out of these five which one uh, Ex Machina Mad Max Fury Road The Martian The Revenant or Star Wars The Force Awakens it's probably going to be Star Wars but see Ex Machina I watched a behind the scenes uh, VFX video brother, that, uh, brother, and, brother. It's, and it's amazing you should go with your gut. Yeah, I'll go with X Machine. Yeah. Well, there you go. Correct. Rob wins ah. a prize. Nah, that one, that one, and I thought that was absolutely stunning. Well, because they, one. like, Great. um, and so, like, I'll post a video on the, the thing where, like, the, um, it's like, she's in the scene all the time, and then, like, take her away and rebuild the background. Yeah. And then, like, rebuild her. So it's, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, using that LiDAR, uh, kind of laser. Yep. And it scan the room and all that, and then mapping or the they take a three dimensional uh, HDR high dynamic range pictures throughout, so that they have all the their correct shadows, highlights, etc. for the whole room, and then they like map her into it. Amazing. I think the best thing about that film was as great as the VFX were, they kind of blended in. You know what I mean? It, it did feel ah. like you didn't really notice them. I mean, for me also, it was a great package in the revenant and the amount of it was very subtle what it did with special effect i mean apart from the bear and the horse jumping off the cliff that that to me looked a bit fake but yeah i would have probably gave it to x my after i really enjoyed x Machina, i thought it was a brilliant film one of the top 10 of the year anyway uh, so yeah so that's oscar's big leo one bit of controversy about it oscar's so white but i think that's more of an industry problem Look towards your indie films, folks, for more diversity. Hopefully, it'll make its way up the road. Uh, and best picture was Spotlight. Sounds so, good. Sounds good. So that was the Oscars. Oscars done and dusted. Right. So let's fire into, and I suppose it goes with the same theme of when trying to weave the themes throughout. We are um, fucking seamless, sir. We are seamless. <laughs> <laughs> so the question for this is. Um, if if this kind of shadowy overlords the, the, the Illuminati or whoever they want to can call them the uh, 33 degree Freemasons the uh, alien um, interdimensional mind vampires that are meeting up with a satch watch on his uh, base on the moon um, that are locking us in a two dimensional flat earth matrix prison if those they, guys those guys um why do the shadow overlords always stay in the shadows if they have so much power 
why do they not just um, change the way that reality works in the sense of again this is the way it's fucking gone and uh, live it or lump it if you don't like it we'll just kill you well I think David Ike's the man to ask that question to be honest mm -hmm. I think if we're going to ask a man a question of that in depthness he's probably going to get a better answer than me but personally if you look at it this way they may be it may be a, a case of you cannot see the forest for the trees situation oh. you know what I mean so on we, we, we have discussed many times and all the different conspiracies and all the different theories that are out there towards the Illuminati or the hidden elite and stuff like that is there a kind of elite power base that may be big corporations and politicians and royal families that we see on a daily basis and we interact with and they interact with us taking our tax money taking our fucking uh, souls sometimes you know just with the mind numbness of it all the daily grind getting us to work for their labour so they can make money and sit we can already see that in plain sight if we look too deep into that we can concoct all these ideas of it must be something even more powerful than this. There must be something above the Bilderberg group controlling them, whereas they're quite happy to just sit and go, actually, it is what controls it. But if you want to believe there's somebody bigger than us, that's fine. Fill your boots. I oh, know, for sure. I d definitely, Ken. On, on one level, I'm agreeing with most of what you're saying, but on another level, it seems to be the more you, the more you read... The more you question, the more you inquire, the more you find that there's more things to read and inquire about. Obviously, humans are very complex, but we've got the same biological machine, the same brain, the same energetic pathways, the same uh, ways of gaining energy and again, pushing energy out and all that sort of stuff. And uh, when you start to get down the rabbit hole, you start to see that throughout time, um, ancient cultures, modern cultures, uh, humans have always kind of asked this question, you know, of uh, the kind of matrix prison kind of idea of a, a okay, what is a bloodline, what is a queen, what is a again, th there's so many um, kind of layers. Why is there secret societies? What is there secret, you know, is it, is it a coincidence that there's 33 degrees to Freemason and there's 33 vertebrae in the back and that there's a channel of pathway or energy from the chakra system or the can, meridians or can, chi, ki, chai, prana, whatever from eastern or from western magic right through to the whole can, um, the, the way that military have hardwired the, the whole human body to see what frequencies we transmit and can now transmit happiness, transmit sadness and, and just like uh, take a whole marching uh, military troop and make them sad, make them depressed by the flip of a, of a button because they've, they've worked out the science of the, the, of the vibrations and the frequencies that the brain operates for particular moods and particular feelings and sensations. Now, all that kind of stuff, we, we know you take that a couple of steps further and you start to think about counterculture. The classic thing about counterculture is um, it's usually where the free minds come from. But if I was controlling society, I would want to control counterculture as well. And we've talked about this in the past. And so you start going in the the... And it sounds like a kind of strange, doesn't seem where I'm going anywhere. But that's what it is when you get down a rabbit hole. I think most of it is just bullshit to get you confused and thinking about and then getting into the hocus pocus kind of crazy lizard dimension, alien, again, spider beings from other dimensions. Yeah. Um, and then you realise that, well, you don't realise anything. Yeah. It's all a construct. But the this thing is, the if, they, if, they, if they had that power, if they were as powerful as a lot of these people claim, the folk, the Illuminati, the secret societies, why would they Why would they live in the shadows? If I was the... If, it, if this was my kingdom and I was the fucking overlord, 
I've uh, like like most stories of overlords and your kind of superhero kind of things, you know, and you can even if you just look at Rome, you know, and the, mm. the main guy, the Caesar, you know, it's his his domain. He has the power. He doesn't lurk about in the shadows. I think. I don't a, know if that is a new. Is just a bit, <laughs> two points kind of like the the idea of finding your salvation within a counterculture and going that route. If we look back on the last five, six decades of counterculture, so if you start off with Elvis. Elvis is seen as bringing black music into the American masses and we can only film him for the waist up because he's doing pelvic thrust and dances. Fast forward 25 years, he's sitting in the White House drinking tea with Richard Nixon. Where's your counterculture there? Fast forward 10 years, the swinging 60s, free love, the Beatles, psychedelia. Where are all these pop stars and speakers from that time. Well, Bob Dylan is playing fucking corporate gigs at a million pound a pop and Paul McCartney's now Sir Paul McCartney and is in with the elite. Fucking fine, we'll have to fast forward another 30, 13 years, we get to 1977, it's Polk, it's wrecking down the establishment, it's God Save the Queen, it's anarchy in the UK. Fast forward 20 years, Fucking Johnny Rotten's on I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here. He's a household name. He's the lovable punk chap now. You know what I mean? So it, it does seem to be that if you're part of the counterculture, it, apart from possibly true counterculture, you will be converted into this way of thinking that the establishment has on board. I've only went back to Elvis because I think the main thrust of this has came through the expansion of communication. You know what I mean? The Masons grew throughout society and throughout history as because they knew the knowledge of how to build these big buildings and stuff and they would only pass it through each other with their handshakes and then they'd explain their knowledge and then you could obviously say there were spiritual ways were put into that but in a kind of very simplistic way that I think about it they had information about building and structures and how to carve fucking stone and all that stuff and that got passed down and they became a secret society and stuff you can see how these build up but with the expansion and explosion of technology that we've had in the last 60 years you can see an escalation of this idea of a, a larger holding group of governments and a secret goings on behind that that's only because behind the scenes governments and Fucking all this are doing stuff like this and it comes out with Freedom of Information Acts like fucking the USA dealing with Iraq and Iran at the same time in the 80s and then that's how we end up where we are today. I think this came back to this week. It was somebody tweeted about how can you believe about all these secret societies if the FBI can't even hack a phone or something like that. Was that what they said? Aye. I don't know if you saw that tweet this week. It's Again... It's it. So that Sorry. that is a quite a, quite a good question, but obviously, if they they can hack the phone. They yeah, that's the thing. The that's phone. A, yeah, but um, it, so it just shows not, you that on one the level, the agenda is not affected by the murder. But it just shows you, man, that, you know that, I mean? that they're completely lying. Okay, and and it was John McAfee, the the can guy from McAfee Software and the Libertarian uh, potential. Uh, candidate for the presidency of the United States of America, he says either the FBI are lying to us or this trouble, this country's in more trouble than you could ever imagine because their cyber security is beyond the shockingly shite yeah. um, or they're lying. And he describes them in his articles how with a hardware and a software engineer he could crack the, the information on the phone in less than a few hours. And can he saying, I'll date it for you. Can, yeah. and, and they're saying, oh, we still need it uh, cracked and we need that. Well, but it, it's almost like saying we need um, a door into every bit of software. Can the encryption individuals in our society have almost become too powerful. So 
just like um, how we uh, create things to view as spies and control the internet. Now with encryption, we need to get rid of encryption. I'm talking from an overlord's perspective. We need to get rid of encryption because it gives citizens a little bit of, uh, again, a, what do you call it, privacy. Yeah. And you don't want that because they're your property. You know, we are or our overlord's property, um, in a sense. You know, mm -hmm. you, you are a worker for... For the overlords. Yeah, you know? I mean, there's that, there's that old joke. It's like if you're feeling depressed and you feel like nobody wants to talk to you or want to do, stop paying your taxes. You'll soon find people want to see you and talk to you and find out how you're doing. Save you up to so, But we don't even get a chance to stop paying our taxes these days. It's all electronic. It all comes straight out of your bank account. It all comes straight out of your pay. In medieval times, you think of medieval times as this draconian, terrible time where the king. Or the Lord would say, it is me, and you must work these three weeks in my fields, tend to my crops, and then in autumn you must bring them in. I think they did a study into the actual amount of time the peasants would spend on the Lord's land, and then on their own land. And we work longer today than they did, paying their severance to the Lord of that land, or the king of that province, you know what I mean? Oh, no, our taxes and our Whatever, whatever percentage in national insurance is taken straight out of our account. There was a there was the, the a, peasants back in the day who we feel were put upon this law for this tax. An article I read a while back and it, it showed you it was America, United States, and it showed you a working family in the seventies, and it was a father, and the father had a, an average salary, and it was just him that worked, and he had two daughters and a mother, and that's all they needed. And then they went to the eighties. It was the the kind by the late eighties. The mother had to get a part time job. By the nineties, the mother had to get a a, a full time job, yeah. just to have the same standard of living, the same kind of um, kind of a house, a car, food, etc. Yeah. You know, um, by the two thousand and sort of ten, you're talking about both the kids have got part time jobs. The father's got a full time and a part time job. The mother's got the full time and a part time job. And just to keep the same standard of living. So the standard of living uh, for America, which is seen as this great place, the American dream, all this sort of stuff is, is rapidly decreasing. Um and uh, again it's we but uh, it's like when we, I think that's one of the reasons why Hollywood um sorry, Hollywood uh, what's his name? Donald Trump is is doing so well in this uh, elections is because he is Mr. Hollywood. He is the guy who's learned all the tricks and understands how, if you like, um, people have just became consumers over the last kind twenty or thirty years, and now they're no longer interested in politics. They're actually they're interested in well they're not interested but they're like they're subconsciously hardwired to to absorb adverts and consumerism and be taught how to buy. So that's what he's using. He's using their skills to win the presidency. He's not using the skills of politics. He's using the skills of the quick hard sale, um, the, 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 the sugar-coated uh, sales pitch um, yeah. that can Americans have been sucking up for 30 years now. And... Is that a part of conspiracies? I think it is because it's uh, it's about who controls the, the, and the, thing, the, the the master workers. You don't you don't want them to think, and that's the whole point of this um, podcast. Everything's an illusion. The podcast that questions everything. It's trying to get people to start questioning some of the fucking things that are right in front of your faces. Because when you do start to question and you start to read and you start to look at ancient cultures and history and Fucking meditation and the power of mind of what the military are doing and all this sort of stuff. You fucking blow your fucking balls off, man. Mm -hmm. I think with the idea of Trump, the, the idea that we just kind of spoke about and almost debunked through me was there, there cannot be this mass elite secret government, but they're probably, the corporations are pulling all the strings and that. It doesn't matter who the president is. Well, it does, because if it was Bernie... I think that there might be some sort of change going within, but out with that, Clinton, Trump, they're all just a mouthpiece for the people that donate to their campaigns and well, no Trump. Business. 
That's that's big. That's Trump's main thing. But that is... I, even that, that, I feel was bullshit. I think he may. No, of course, may, it is bullshit. He, but that, his 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 idea that Trump doesn't have partners or doesn't have MD backing him. He might go, "Oh, it's all my own money." But even his money that's been filtered through as a donation from the Trump company, if you know what I mean. It's not his own personal money. It's his company, and that his company will have a board and. He what he's he's a he's a fucking classy bullshit the guy and he's quite happy to take votes for the KKK if they endorse him because he'll say in another program or oh, I don't want to be endorsed for the KKK but if they want to fucking endorse me that's fine get the votes in he's kind of making a whole thing of this idea that I oh, vote for me because I'm totally different but for me he's an anticipus of a fucking retarded fascist twanger who just oh. No, for sure, for sure. So, like, um, I lost my, I lost my train. I thought they just, they just. So did just... I. Um, so we'll move on to the next one, which, f for me, the next one is, um, is, uh, YouTube University. Yep. And uh, this is a big part of, um, obviously in today's modern age, um, education is free for some people and not free for the mass majority of people. mass majority of people on the planet don't get free education. They don't get the ability to uh, a good a good schooling for whatever reason, um, socio-economical, political, uh, etc. But in today's modern age, most countries are online. And uh, as more countries and continents, Africa, um, again, Middle East, North South America, Oceania, Asia, uh, you're getting big fantastic resources like YouTube where obviously me and you are on YouTube, we create videos, we say what we need to say in Kabaja. Is it the truth? Who knows? But there's like proper bona fide um, uh, science, religion, if that's your cup of tea, whatever, conspiracy theories, philosophy, arts. Cups of tea? Yeah, cups of tea, you know, if you want to make make the perfect cup of tea, there's a video for it. And the beautiful thing about it is there's like, on YouTube, you have videos that will take you through basic mathematics all the way through. You get videos that show you the basic physics, basic biology, chemistry, advanced physics. Um, there's audio books. Like the, I found a channel the other day and the guy had like audio books, all classic audio books, old school classic books that the kind of founding forefathers of america would have been reading and again about law and about all these again amazing things and some of these like read them all out and uploaded them into a 16 hour fucking audio book for you to to take in you know it's a a fantastic resource but i suppose the problem with youtube university is you have to take responsibility for your own learning and I think that's the best kind of learning when you decide I'm going to learn um, how to be a, a businessman or I'm going to learn mathematics for the pleasure of learning mathematics. I'm going to learn about a different part of history that I wasn't taught or I'm just going to learn some history or yeah. geography or, or fucking anything. Like how did they make that special effects in the Martian movie? You know what I mean? Type that shit into YouTube University. By the way, YouTube University is obviously just YouTube, but it is like a university, and in some cases better than a university. Well, I think uh, I will uh, put my hat in the ring for a couple of places. If, if you're into filmmaking, I would definitely check out uh, nofilmschool.com. It's a great resource for filmmaking tips, articles about filmmaking and acting and writing and uh, directing, all that sort of stuff is all brought together on like a timeline. Uh, when new kit comes out, new videos, so it takes stuff from YouTube and Vimeo and uh, articles from IndieWire and throughout the World Wide Web and brings it all together. So as you say, you could spend a year going through all that stuff and you're not going to get a certificate from YouTube University, but I think there's a, a wealth of knowledge out there that uh, 
I, I would, think every, everybody has always went, how do you do that thing? Or give me a minute, I'll just Google it. And then you Google it and you get a YouTube video about it. You watch a YouTube video and you go in and make pancakes because that's what you're trying to make, the perfect pancake. People just need to realise that there's more than just how to make pancakes, how to boil an egg. I did Google how to boil an egg once and it, that's how I boil eggs for now on. It's absolutely amazing, the, 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 the things. And as you say, I, so if you were to do a one-year... But the same timetable as you would go to university to learn film making and just go to nofilmschool.com and do the can but learn about all the different technology the can how a camera works different shot sizes how a storyboard what is a story character um can all that sort of stuff casting you'd be a fucking far better filmmaker than you would get out of university and you'd save yourself cash but you wouldn't get a bit of paper Mm -hmm. But you would save yourself a bit of cash. Now, there is a few um, uh, universities uh, that do free courses. Um, so there's a, there's a website called futurelearn.com, and they compile. It's all just short courses, say six weeks, ten weeks. Um, and you can get a certificate at the end if you want. Uh, it costs you like 50 quid for the certificate, but the actual course is free. I think it's just for the, the admin. They kinda, do kinda. quite cool joint stuff. Cause I've done a couple of their courses. So like the BBC here in the UK, they, all, they did a screenwriting course. Yep. It was over six weeks. So Future Learn and BBC combined together to put forth this course and then they ran it and you just followed it week to week. So, so that was stuff, interesting. Stuff like that is really cool because you get like, um, like if you're just thinking about going to do some screenwriting and stuff like that. Here's a, a well thought through process on a timeline that's structured and it's free and it gets you into the uh, into the way of thinking. And I think that's the key point when it comes to um, almost everything we've talked about and everything that we do talk about is education and self-learning. Taking the responsibility to educate yourself, to be sceptical, to ask questions and not to just yeah. accept the shit that's... Because um, that, I think, is one of the biggest problems with today's political system, today's economical system, today's just system, is mass majority of people are drones. They they, they, can, they, they get a bit of paper, they don't get a bit of paper, and uh, they, they don't think about it, and they just accept shit. And... Yeah. Uh, that's kind of a strange way to, to live. Obviously, if you were a mass-controlling, manipulatively shadowy overlord, you would want your cattle to be docile, you know, up to the eyeballs and Prozac and uh, kind of just dazing through life and then dying. Mm. But at the same I th time, I think there's a, making your life comfortable. There's a flip side that there's a kind of... They need to get members of the public to a certain degree of education. Oh, to work knowledge. in this, aye, this you know system. I mean? Because I remember when I did history at school, uh, failed it twice at higher, got a D, both. Take that in your pants. <laughs> David Starkey. Uh, there was the, the Boer War that we fought in in the late 1800s when they uh, went to enlist men and Asked for people to come and join the army. The the kind of education and health for these people was that bad that they had to rethink how how they got the British public to that age to certain degree of health, certain degree of education. Uh, you know, it was just so the government rearranged stuff and put implemented stuff like. Uh, the, the minimum leaving age of school and stuff like that so they had a decent amount of education and then they would start introducing stuff like money for food for poor people and all that and at the beginning of the welfare state at its very basic form back then because the army needed people as cannon fodder and the people who were coming forward were cannon fodder weren't they educated weren't they healthy enough so there's a kind of they need to get to a certain level but yes yeah, no, definitely for, but for I think, sure that's what I... there is a there is a kind of case to be in that classrooms of 33 children from the age of 5 to 16 is very hard to handle it's very hard to kind of keep 
in a concentrated state to actually learn stuff. So they just give them the very, very basic. And they don't, and I, I feel, even back in your generation in the, in the 90s, they were only installing in you an idea that self-determination within learning is a much bigger prize than actually passing the exam. For me, that's the way I look back at it now. I'm quite lucky now within the job that I do. Monday to Friday, we have an open access to lynda.com and the courses on there. It does a, a, such a big wealth of course. They're like YouTube University, except sadly you have to pay for them. But the, no, you but you don't. That's a beautiful thing. And most of the stuff that you'll find on Linda, you'll find yeah, on you can find YouTube. YouTube. You know, it's either ripped off of Linda yeah. or it's um, an alternative. But the, can the, there's nothing that you can find that you have to pay for in terms of education, in terms of, like, if you want to be, learn how the stock markets work, if you want a business degree, or if it's, you want to learn Photoshop, you want to be a graphic designer, you want, again, code websites, you want to, again, work out how to do a computer program, how to hack, how to, anything, YouTube. Yep. Linda.com, again, the whole idea of subscribing to get that shit just makes me angry because, it's free. There's absolutely no barrier. If you have a computer or a phone and internet connection, there's no barrier to you learning. And as soon as can people think there's a barrier, or can they have to get a certificate, or can or this kind of, I think people get have to step out the way. I'm no dishing Linda. It's a comprehensive and they're, they're, they have fantastic. Uh, what you call it, well-structured content. content and programs, but at the end of the day, it's like a fucking university, it's like a private subscribed university online, where you can get all that content for free from YouTube, all you've got to do is ask YouTube what it is you want to learn, and get in there and watch, And but it's the same with like conspiracy theories, you know, or science, or um, philosophy, you know, you are like, oh, who's Jung? Just type it in, and there'll be like in interviews, there'll be um, books, audio books, there'll be um, can, can, and the, the beautiful thing there's content from like, like folk with education, there's content with folk with education, there's people that are experts in that field, professors, multiple PhDs, whatever, putting up their videos, putting up their uh, can breakdowns and reviews or ways to look at can so it's a whole host of stuff and there's always something for your level and it's free which you can not fucking beat with a stick yep. so uh, i would highly recommend that motherfuckers yep. go on to youtube and uh use it as youtube university educate yep. yourself and uh learn about everything and I would, anything i would state right off the bat though the most important thing to do on youtube would be to subscribe to this podcast which is also available there that's and uh, click on do, the adverts that's would, always good <laughs> so i would do that first get that subscribe to get the thumbs up clicked and then the world is your oyster of information yep go over to the energeticmind.com buy some art healthmedsimple.info buy <laughs> some books yeah click on the google ads Right, so let's move into the meteor shower. Our, fa our favourite place on the planet, which isn't even a planet, it's in space. We love to go to space. So this week in the bonny, bonny land of Scotland, we were attacked by aliens. Oh, yeah. Sending down their their ships of the night. What into, was that, their shit? The, in, ships. <laughs> into the core of the planet to secretly rise up in 50 years' time. Or, uh, just in the uh, Berwickshire, just in the Scottish borders, about quarter to seven on Monday, both big flash of light, beautiful, beautiful large meteor, bang. We are so happy to live in the age where people are that paranoid about insurance claims in their car, that everybody's getting wee dash cams like Russia, and uh, a man caught it, uh, so... Rob, hopefully you'll put the wee video link up for people to have a wee swat chat. Yep, yep. So, we had our very own meteor attack this week in Scotland. It's pretty awesome, I, I love stuff like that, like, Kimia. 
You you are someone who loves to gaze at the stars, and uh, it's definitely something that's kind of underrated in today's society. When you look back at history, that's all our kind of people done, and they they mapped everything, like all our measurements, all our understanding of everything, all, all our gods are essentially just stars and movements of stars and how they danced through the sky and they became yeah. the stories of our gods and yet nobody looks at the, st the sky anymore unless it's like a, an event like a like a meteor sort of thing they get caught on a dash cam and it's you know a 30 second clip and that's yeah. like so the... it's just i just my I said it was the Scottish Borders, but it can be seen this far low as the Scottish Borders. It was really above Aberdeenshire, so that's quite... That's the northeast of Scotland. That's the wee pokey bit at the top. So that's that's where it was seen mainly, but it could be seen as far down as the Scottish Borders, so that's quite a distance away. So, uh, I'm just trying to find if I can find... If I can get some range and size of the bugger. Because the, the very smart people who work all this stuff out kind of work out but it was cool the, the footage is really cool because it's a dark dark night and then all of a sudden it's lit up by this exploding it just shows you in the same I think it was this year there was a confirmed death of a man by meteor did you read about that the first person in history to be have a confirmed death by meteor uh, no no so watch your skies people watch your skies so I thought that was pretty cool just a wee bit because I know how we love to talk about space. So that is what was happening down our way, folks. And then we'll just move into a um, pet uh, peeve uh, of the week. Is that uh, what you uh, Yep, yep. And a, a, a good uh, space movie. I thought the movie was pretty good. It was The Martian. Uh, I watched it and I thought, hey, this was pretty good. Um, and I kept on watching. I thought, hey, this is pretty good. And then out of nowhere... He started uh, again, slicing up tatties and uh, using the other crew members poo. Spoiler this is alert. Big, big spoilers case. alert. Big, big spoilers. Like, uh, if you've not seen The Martian, basically skip. Skip this section. Yep. Stop the podcast. Um, and basically, he cuts the, the tatties in half and hydrates the poo. And then he has a tatty farm or a potato farm. Um, and... The sort of pet peeve is all the other food that you see in the film um, from other astronauts and when he's counting the rations to work it all out is all vacuum-packed silver. Uh, and as you would expect from anything, and as you know, they were trying to be quite sciencey and quite realistic in the Martian to kind of um, the way astronauts um, can operate in space and stuff. They just, he just seemed to have a big open fucking sack of tatties that he had about 500 tatties that he spliced in two and then made a tatty farm. And it was like, well, they weren't they like processed and dehydrated in vacuum packed silver foil. He must have had like a genuine, I've just been to the farm, get a big, uh, a loose um, tatties in a sack with soil on them. In a in a paper bag and just shove them onto the the rocket and off we go, and uh, we'll get them out. Like it was the only vegetable that he had. Like yeah. it was a, it was like there was no other seeds. There was no other mention of anything. It was just a case of oh I've got some tatties, and at first I thought right he's got a tatty he's got a splice that but then he had like fifty tatties, and you're like what the fuck is this shit man you've just like brought. It was like, oh, the guy's dehydrating in the middle of the fucking desert. Oh, we've just fun a river. It's like, aye, okay, that's convenient. So apart from that, I thought the movie was all right. But I still, your main, your main I, if guy, somebody can explain that to me, where you <laughs> got the tatties, that'd be pretty cool. Yeah. So the main gripe is NASA dehydrate and then foil pack all their food. Yep. But in the Martian, they, forgot, they never... Did that to the potato sack and they took a full sack of tatties with them that they never ate the entire time until they left. I, and I basically yeah. just. They had. I, fuck, fuck you, Ridley Scott, you prick. A big sack of tatties yeah. that, that, that. That's what you get for Prometheus, you fucking doof. It's like. Um, but the thing about Hollywood movies is always that in the, the Transformers movies, the first one, 
the keep the big yeah. evil fucking pot frozen it frozen in a fucking fridge the guy just flew in for space space <laughs> is fucking far colder than that fucking fridge he still operated in space mm. and you're like is, is this supposed to be science fiction or is it just fucking fiction um, ask you a question about the martian yep what genre would you say it was Well, straight away, I'm, I'm saying sci-fi, because yeah. obviously it's science and fiction. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a kind of a story of, of uh, survival and a story of the ability, the human um, a can condition of mm -hmm. the ability to survive, the ability to not gee up, um, to endure, to believe. Um, so it could fit in that kind yeah. of category of, you know, there's a few... The kind of movies in that kind of category of inspirational. It's kind of cast away in space. Aye, aye. Well, that that's actually that's that's it's almost like when uh, kind of went to pitch for for an alien and they basically one line that they said Jaws in space. Yep. So aye, no, the one line for the master. So just, it's just the cast the, away in space. Yeah, just the Golden Globes. Uh, put it in the category comedy and musical. <laughs> Comedy I mean, and musical. So the Raven, the Raven won the Golden Globe for uh, best motion picture in a, in a drama, and the Martian won it for best motion picture in a comedy or musical. Nah, I don't think it's a comedy or a musical. You need to out, you need to get out with the Hollywood Foreign Press and the Golden Globes Association. Don't get me wrong, I was laughing at the fact that he produced a big fucking sack of tattoos <laughs> at his ass, but <laughs> but uh, and uh... <laughs> but it's just uh, was the game. Since we're talking about awards, I thought we'll go back to the the, kind of, the one that kind of kicks it all off, and then just like they they put it in that. I think that was only so they could get Matt Damon and Ridley Scott to turn up at the rewards show. But, yeah. So yes, if NASA could let us know, because I know how they listen to the show. Yeah. Uh, if they could let us know why the sack of tatties was not hydrated and foil packed. Well, well, you think about it in the sense of it, if the potatoes were there for eating, most of the with these kind of survival rations, even military rations. How many eyes did they have on them? They they've cooked. They cook them and they 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 they. they it's pre-cooked so yep. that you just have to open that sachet and eat it you, there's yep. obviously a process to heat it but it, it's all there it's like eating a tin of baked beans you just mm. open the tin it's all good to go but these potatoes weren't good to go it wasn't he wasn't planting baked potatoes you know yeah. he, he was planting proper tatties how long so, did, i mean and how long did it take the tatties to get to mars you know what i mean and the, it takes you a while the, to get to Mars, so I mean, and you it, put your tatties underneath your sink no, and then come back to them the time it takes you to go to Mars. Um, Don't nobody begin tatties. One second here. Space seeds, vegetables. Right, so the, in China, that's the other keyword there in that search. China, I'm pretty much sure. Um, China for years, yep, there's some pictures, brilliant. China's growing giant food with seeds from outer space. Giant space vegetables could feed the world, um, and this was a story I seen years ago. But it just clicked that seeds, when they go into space and come back, they produce really large vegetables. And uh, I'll put a link to that on yeah. uh, um, because it's crazy. These big, huge vegetables that the, the the Chinese space program been putting these uh, vegetables into space and stuff like that. And uh, so, by the way, the tat is no fucking huge. Did they grow the tatties in the way they are? I don't... Did they have, did they grow them enough, put them in the bag and then bring them to Mars? Or did they put them on the spaceship, grow them as they went to Mars? Go to Mars, pick them, put them in a the sack? This is a very in-depth conversation about the tatties and... You know what it is. People know what it is. That's yeah. what it's all about. I'll need to, I'll need to re watch the Mars and just to... Go over that you should. One. So, um... I would just call it a day, yeah. Yeah, it was so good, man. Right at an hour, so uh, thanks again, Greg, for, no for problem, coming buddy. on. Thanks for having me. Talking a talk, so just a wee quick recap. Hollywood people at the bottom taking it to the to the masses. Shadow overlords, YouTube, get some fucking learning. Yeah. Cool as meteors, Oscars, 
and the uh, tatties on Mars. Um, if you want to help the show and you like what we're doing, uh, give us a click on uh, any of the adverts on the, the, the website. Yep. If you're listening to iTunes, you know, or whatever you're listening, give us a review. Join us in conversation on Facebook and Twitter. We post loads of shit on Facebook, um, daily memes and videos and all that sort of good stuff. Contribute and uh, check out our sponsors. Some good quality shizing right there. And we've also got a back catalogue now of 20 plus episodes, so check them out too. Nice one. Any final words, Greg? Uh, if anybody sees that hang with a guy about JFK and the Sasquatch... <laughs> we will we will get to it we promise we just ran out of time near to get onto it because that guy sent me a new a new thing through I need to check it fact, but once I've fact checked that I'll update it and we'll get back to you on it sorry sorry for the delay in the GFK Sasquatch so on moon with a mind vampire yep. love we'll it get, well, we'll get to it I promise nice one I'll take it easy and uh... yep you too man everything is an illusion it's brought to you by RobWallaceMedia.com Award winning media TheEnergeticMind.com Inspirational, motivational and thought provoking art And Health Made Simple By today, change your life forever HealthMadeSimple.info Thank you And remember Question everything <laughs> <laughs>